أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فأتي فرعون فقولا إن رسول رب العالمين أن أرسل معنا بني إسرائيل قال ألم نربك فينا وليدا ولبثت فينا من عمرك سنين وفعلت فعلتك التي فعلت وأنت من الكافرين قال فعلتها إذا وأنا من الضالين ففررت منكم لما خفتكم فوهب لي ربي حكما فوهب لي ربي حكما وجعلني من المرسلين وتلك نعمة تمنها علي أن عبدت بني إسرائيل الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة المتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين So inshallah today uh, we'll be starting the discussion from ayah number 15 or excuse me ayah number 16 um, and that's where I've recited from. So to present a brief translation, go both of you to Pharaoh and say, we bring a message from the Lord of the worlds. Ayah number 17, let the children of Israel leave with us. Number 18, Pharaoh said, did we not bring you up as a child among us? Did you not stay with us for many years? 19, and then you committed that crime of yours? You were so ungrateful. Ayah number 20, Moses replied, I was misguided when I did it. Ayah number 21, and I fled from you in fear later, my Lord. I, and I f- fled from you in fear. Later, my Lord gave me wisdom and made me one of his messengers. Ayah number 22, and it is this that you have enslaved the children of Israel, the favor with which you reproach me. So inshallah, we'll be starting from, as I mentioned before, ayah number 16. In the previous uh, discussion, we started the passage about Musa alayhi salam. And again, to very briefly recap, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, remember the story of Musa, remember the story and the time when your Lord called out to Musa alayhi salam and He told him, go to these terrible people who are doing terrible things. And they are the people of Fir'aun. That they have absolutely no consciousness of Allah. As astounding as that is. And Musa alayhi salam pleaded before Allah, saying that, My Lord, my Master, I'm afraid that they will reject me. And my chest will become constricted and my tongue will not flow freely. So please send my brother Harun on this mission with me. And they claim against me a crime, which we talked about in detail in the previous session. And I'm afraid that they may try to kill me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consoled Musa alayhi salam by telling him, absolutely not. I will not allow that to happen. Rather, both of you, you and your brother Harun, both of you go along with the miraculous signs we have provided you. And remember the fact that without a shred of a doubt, we are with you, listening, very attentively, paying attention to this entire conversation and your entire interaction with them. Go both of you to Fir'aun And that's where we're starting from Fa'tiya Fir'aun So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands both of them He says Fa'tiya Fir'aun Both of you go to Fir'aun Fa'qula And both of you say to him Both of you should say to, the, to them Inna Rasulu Rabbil Alameen That most definitely we are Bringing a message from the Lord and the master of all humanity and all people in all the world. Now, the, the, the message is pretty straightforward. The gist of the ayah is pretty straightforward here in ayah number 16. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells both of them to go to Fir'aun. Now, something that's a little bit unique here. 
somewhat unique here. In other places like in Surah Al-Nazi'at, in Surah, uh, Surah Taha, and other places where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the same instruction to Musa alayhi salam that go and talk to Fir'aun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses another word, idhab, fadhab, which dhihab, the word dhihab, dhahab yadhabu means to go. It's a very basic word that means to go. And it doesn't really carry any specific tone or connotation. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word fa'tiya, i'ti. An i'ti al-qawm al-zalimeen, fa'tiya fir'awna. And so ata ya'ti, which this verb is, it also means to go somewhere, to arrive at a place, to head out towards a place. It also means the same thing. But it does have a specific tone to it. It is unique. And the tone that it carries is that it has a lighter more uh, gentler tone to it. It almost has an air of um, dignity and sophistication. And the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this particular word here is in the other places like Surah Taha where Allah uses a more general word where He says, فَذْهَبَا إِلَى فِرْعَوْنَ Right? Both of you go to Fir'aun, he uses the general word for just go to him. But over there Allah includes the instruction about how to conduct yourself when you go. Where he says, فَقُولَا لَهُ قَوْلَ اللَّيْنَا That when you speak to him, speak to him very gently and softly. Speak to him with an air of dignity. Which is quite fascinating. I mean this is a criminal of the highest order. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him, speak to him gently. And yes, there, the, the objective is mentioned here, but I'd like to kind of get to something else. First and foremost, Allah says, لَعَلَّهُ يَتَذَكَّرُ يَخْشَى Because at the end of the day, if the goal of the objective is to get him to come around, to get him to heed the message, then sacrifice the part of your nafs that wants to go and rub it in his face and speak to him gently. Swallow your pride and speak to him Kindly. Because if you're trying to bring him around, then that's going to be your best opportunity, your best chance of doing so. Number one. But number two, at the same time, the Prophet ﷺ teaches us about this. The Quran talks about this. We talked about this before. That at the end of the day, even if the other party is conducting themselves in a less than admirable fashion, why should you sacrifice your dignity and your integrity to try to match wits with that person? We don't believe in the philosophy of fighting fire with fire. We don't do that. It's always a very famous statement um, that just resonates with me. I believe it's... Uh, Maybe it's, it's attributed to a few different people throughout history, but the one that I recall, it's attributed to the great uh, revolutionary, the fighter Umar al-Mukhtar, who basically when um, he was fighting against the occupiers, the colonizers, and the way that they would do is when they would capture people from amongst the people who were trying to gain their freedom, they would torture them and mutilate them and murder them. And when they were able to catch some of the Italian soldiers, some of the occupiers, then they did not treat them that way. And when some of his soldiers objected to him, saying, this is what they do to our people, then he very famously remarked, and this was said by people before him as well, but he very famously remarked at that moment, saying, they are not our teachers. They're not our teachers. Whenever we get caught in that sentiment of, but they're doing it, they're doing this, they're doing that, that purely and solely comes from a place of nafs. That's the lower self speaking. And that is indicative of a mindset that does not factor in that there is a life of the hereafter. Where ultimately all scores will be settled. All the accounts will be settled. That is indicative of a mindset that is just solely focused on the here and the now. And that's not who we are. وَالْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ وَأَبَقَى it's better and it's everlasting. So yes, if we have to defer something to the Akhirah, that's not complacency. That is not weakness. That is not frailty. But that is intelligence. 
That's faith. That's iman. That's belief. And so, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, the, the, the instruction about the type of tone to use is not specifically mentioned. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still builds that tone of conduct yourself with the highest of conduct is built into the verb that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses when He commands them to go. فَأْتِيَا فِرْعَوْنَا Go with dignity. Remember who you are. Remember who you represent. And what you stand for. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, فَأْتِيَا فِرْعَوْنَا فَقُولَا And say that we have been sent by Allah, who is the Lord and the Master of all people. Now there's a little curiosity that's mentioned here within the ayah. And that is the fact that a similar ayah is in another place in the Qur'an where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَقُولَا إِنَّا رَسُولَا رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ That go and say that both of us, we are two messengers sent by God. We are two messengers sent by God. And there's another place in the Qur'an, Surah Al-Shura, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only is speaking to Musa alayhi salam and He tells him, go and say, I am a messenger from God. Both of those make sense. Alright, they're obvious. When he speaks to both of them, he gives both of them instruction. He says, say we are two messengers from God. Over there he's only mentioning what he had told Musa alayhi more specifically, because he was the one in charge. And if you talk about the one in charge, then everyone else kind of falls in line. In the majwa'ila al-imamu li'utamma bihi, that's why you have a leader, you fall in line behind them. Okay? So if you address the leader, the Prophet ﷺ, it just might seem like it's not related, but it's all always related. It's all always interrelated. Right? Philosophically, it's a very deep, profound religion. Sutratul Imami, Sutratul Ma'mum. The Prophet ﷺ said that if there's a very large congregation being conducted, so imagine the congregation we have here, a couple of hundred people, a lot of people. Imagine we were praying somewhere outside, outdoors in an open field. So the Prophet ﷺ said, when you pray somewhere in the open, you should put something in front of you so that people can cross and pass if they need to. Okay? So it's called a sutra. You put something up in front of you, a barrier or something, that signifies to people that you're praying, and also allows people beyond the barrier, beyond that little marker, that they can then cross and pass and go about their business. But what do you do? So if I'm praying by myself, I put something up. I put my backpack in front of me, good to go. But what do we do if there's 200 people praying outside? Do we have to find a gigantic wall? Does everybody have to put their backpacks out in front of them? The Prophet ﷺ says, Sutratul Imami, Sutratul Ma'mum. That if the Imam puts out something in front of him, that, qual- that counts for everybody. Alright? So, Qira'atul Imami, Qira'atul Ma'mum. The Prophet ﷺ also mentioned that if the Imam recites something, he also covers the people behind him standing as well. And that's why when the Imam recites in the prayer, we stand and we listen. So, what I'm basically saying is that that's the role of leadership. Alright, so, in one place in the Qur'an, Allah tells both of them, go and say we are two messengers from God. In one place, Allah tells, only speaking to Musa specifically, He says, go and tell them that I am a messenger from God. Both of those make total sense. This is the one in the middle that leaves a little bit of a question. That is a curiosity. That here in Surah Al-Shu'ara, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to both of them. فَقُولَا Both of you say, inna That most definitely we are Rasul. We are a messenger from God. How are two people one messenger? So there's two answers to this question at the same time. First you have to answer the question linguistically, then you have to answer the question rhetorically. So first you have to answer the question in terms of nahu, just grammar, language. Then you have to answer the question in terms of balaba, rhetorically. Like what is this communicating here? Okay, so linguistically speaking, there's an interesting rule in the Arabic language where a singular noun does not only just represent a, an individual party, but a singular noun sometimes can also represent, and it, it's called ismul jins. It can also represent everything that falls within that category. So by saying we are a messenger from God, it's like saying that we are both messen- we are both a messenger from God. 
And that's something that is very common within the Arabic language. That you don't have to mention the plural, you can mention the singular. Because it's not so much being used as a singular noun anymore, now it's being used as a title. That we both carry the title of messenger from God. Everybody understand that? You wouldn't say that we both carry the title of doctors. That sounds silly. We both carry the title of doctor, singular. Alright? I gave the example of doctor because so the daisies can understand. Alright? Everyone's like, oh, I get it. Right? So, um, but we both carry the title. Go and say to Fir'aun that we both carry the title of messenger from God. Makes sense. But rhetorically speaking, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, choose to say it in this way when it could have been said that we are both messengers from God? By using the singular noun as a title for both of them, what it does is that it shows uniformity between them. It shows congruence and uniformity. That your message needs to be unified. It needs to sound like y'all are the same person speaking. Nobody contradicts anybody. Your message needs to be completely in sync with one another. And that's very important. Right? That's something that's very, very important. And in that is a very profound lesson. That if we have not properly figured out things amongst ourselves, what will be on our impact on anyone else? If we can't get done with bickering and quarreling with one another, then what good are we to anybody else? And particularly when we decide to go out there, to step out there and really take the mantle of addressing humanity, we need to have put in enough work, not just superficially, we need to have put in enough work inside, internally, within our own home that we go out there with a very unified message. And that doesn't take away from our diversity, but the core of the message needs to be unified. That's very, very important. And so, inna rasulu rabbil alameen. Ayah number 17, an arsil ma'ana bani Israel. The second. Um, the second proposal that you're making to them. And that also we ask you, we present to you, arsil, that release, send ma'ana with us, Bani Israel. The Banu Israel, the people that you have enslaved, that you have oppressed, release them to us, send them with us. Allow them to go free. And in ayah number 18, now Fir'aun responds. This is the response of Fir'aun. He starts off by saying, Qala, Fir'aun said, Alam nurabbika fina walida. Alam nurabbika fina walida. The first thing he mentions is that, did we not raise you amongst us from when you were a child? Did we not raise you amongst us from when you were a child? Now, this is of course talking back, and like I said, this is a more uh, summarized account of the story of Musa alayhi salam. But in different places in the Qur'an, um, in Surah Taha, this is mentioned, in Surah Al-Qasas, it's mentioned very beautifully, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Fir'aun had sent his soldiers out, to massacre the children of Banu Israel, that Musa alayhi salam's mother, وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ أَنْ أَرْضِعِيهِ She was very worried about her child, about the safety of her baby. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we inspired to her to nurse your baby. فَإِذَا خِفْتِ عَلَيْهِ فَأَلْقِيهِ فِي الْيَمِّ وَلَا تَخَافِي وَلَا تَحْزَنِي And when you are afraid that they are coming to get him, then put him into the river, and do not fear and do not grieve over him. Inna raduhu ilayki. Not only will we return him back to you, waja'iluhu min al but we will make him a messenger of God. Faltaqatahu alu Fir'aun. And so it goes on to talk about the fact that Fir'aun's family 
Specifically, the wife of Fir'aun, she ended up finding this baby in the basket or box floating about in the river. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَقَالَتِ امْرَأَةُ فِرْعَوْنُ قُرَّةُ عَيْنِ لِي وَلَكَ When she found this child, she was so overcome. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Taha, He says, وَأَلْقَيْتُ عَلَيْكَ مَحَبَّةً مِنِّي وَلِتُصْنَعَ عَلَىٰ عَيْنِي In Surah Taha, Allah says that we poured love down upon you, O Musa, so that when the wife of Fir'aun laid eyes on you, she immediately fell in love with you. She cared for you like she would care for her own child. And she in fact petitioned Fir'aun and argued with him that I want to raise this child as my own. لا تقتلوه عسى أن ينفعنا أو نتخذه ولدا وهم لا يشعرون Do not kill this baby. We shall raise him as one of our own. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided this miraculous means of protection for Musa alayhi salam. And so Fir'aun here, that's what he's making reference to. When he says, أَلَمْ نُرَبِّكَ فِيْنَا وَلِدًا Wait a second. Didn't we raise you amongst us since you were a child? وَلَبِثْتَ فِيْنَا مِنْ عُمُرِكَ سِنِينَ And you stayed amongst us for many many years of your life? Up until a decade or so ago when you ran away from here? You became a young man. You lived in my home. You ate my food. You wore the clothes I gave you. You slept on the bed I provided to you. So he's basically recounting, I done all of this for you. These are all my favors upon you. You're here to talk to me? You're going to tell me what to do? So that's the angle that he's taking here. That these are all the favors I've done upon you. Now first of all, not only did I spare your life as a child, as a baby, but then I raised you and let you grow up in my home. And then he goes on in ayah number, 18, in ayah number 19, he continues on. And this ayah is, the, the, the ayah number 19 and ayah number 20, or, or excuse me, ayah number 19 is very interesting how he says what he says. He says, وَفَعَلْتَ فَعَلَتَ كَلَّتِي فَعَلْتَ I want everyone to listen. Even without maybe grasping all the Arabic here, you can hear the repetition. وَفَعَلْتَ فَعَلَتَكَ أَلَّتِي فَعَلْتَ And you did the thing, you committed the action that you had committed. Right? He's not mentioning what it is, but he's taunting him with it. And when you repeat something like this, obviously it's sarcasm. Aren't you the one who did that thing that you did back when you did it? Right? That's you. Huh. وَفَعَلْتَ فَعَلَتَكَ الَّتِي فَعَلْتَ And there's something really profound here, very remarkable that the Mufassilun, they point out. We talked about what he's referring to previously. That this was an accident that occurred at the hands of Musa a.s. It was a very unfortunate situation. Things became heated. Action was taken, but the outcome was something that was unintentional. This was an accident that occurred. And as severe as the, as the outcome was, accidents do happen, mistakes do occur. And that was something that Musa a.s. was repentant about. It shows, he's aware of it, he's cognizant of it, he lives with it. That's the first thing he mentioned before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. هُمْ عَلَيَّ ذَنْبُ but we see that Fir'aun did not spare any time in bringing it up again and taunting him with it and holding it over his head. And this is the difference between prophetic and Fir'aunic behavior. This is the difference. We as a community, right, we always talk about the fact that we're trying to Bring people in. Call people in. And many times, we're going to have people who are going to come to the deen, accept Islam, or just realize their Islam, 
later on in their life. They will have made mistakes. Things will have happened. But it's a test of our character at that time how we receive them. How we welcome them, how we handle them. Do we hang constantly, even when they have repented and they've made amends, and they recognize what they've done wrong, and they're trying to work on it, and they're fixing it, are we still going to continue to hang it over their head? And treat them as criminals? Or will we have the character of the Prophet ﷺ? Where when Ikrimah, the son of Abu Jahl, comes to the Prophet ﷺ, he, his father, was the enemy of the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims. And the son himself, Ikrimah, he had participated in a number of different wars and battles against the Prophet Muslims. He personally had tried to assassinate the Prophet on a number of occasions. But when he's finally returning back, and he's hoping to make amends, not only does the Prophet welcome him, not only does the Prophet forgive him, but the Prophet tells the companions that when Ikrimah comes here, do not speak ill of his father in his presence. Because it will hurt his feelings. Don't do it. Giving someone that opportunity to heal and to find themselves, that's profound. And what's the outcome of that? When and where and how does Ikrima eventually die? Ikrima dies later on as a shaheed in the battlefield of fighting on behalf of Islam, defending Islam. The man who spent the entirety of his young adult life fighting against Islam, loses his life fighting for Islam, as a martyr, as a shaheed. That's the outcome of that. And he says, And you were ungrateful. You were ungrateful. The word kafir, of course, we typically know that it's the opposite of mu'min, believer, disbeliever. But the word kufr, it's in its roots, in its etymology, in its origins, it actually means to bury something, to hide or conceal something. That's why a farmer, the one who sows the seeds in the soil, would be called kafir, an old, old Arabic. And also, because of that, it became used rhetorically and figuratively in the meaning of being ungrateful. Because you do not acknowledge the blessing, you hide the blessing. Alright? And then later on, of course, it refers to disbelief and not believing in Allah because that's the ultimate form of ingratitude. So here he's using it in the meaning of ingratitude and you were ungrateful. I did all of this for you. I spared your life as a baby. I raised you. And when you made a mistake, then you ran away from here. So you were ungrateful. Now, that's a very difficult position to be put in. So listen how Musa a.s. responds. He says, Qala, he said, I number 20, fa'altuha. Yes, I did that. And think about the type of person and the integrity that it takes to accept your mistake when pointed out to you. The honesty and the integrity that it takes. Yes, I did that. I admit it. I did it. I made that mistake. فَعَلْتُهَا إِذَنْ But I want to remind you. He says, I did that. Yes. But I did it before I was aware of what I'm aware now. And in, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word وَأَنَا مِنَ الضَّالِينَ When I was bal. Now balal, bal in the Arabic language It has three core meanings In the dictionary The first one, the first meaning is To not be aware of something To not be aware of something And that's, Allah uses it in that meaning in the Quran Where He says لَا يَضِلُّ رَبِّي وَلَا ينسى. My Lord is not Unaware of anything. Nor does my Lord forget. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Himself in the Qur'an that Allah is not unaware of anything at all, nor does He ever forget. Okay? That's one meaning of it. The second meaning of it that we're a little bit more familiar with was غَيْرِ الْمَغْدُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ It means to be astray, to be off the path of guidance. That's the second meaning. And yet a third meaning of it means to uh, be lost, to, to, to be absent, to not be found. All right? That we buried it within the earth. It couldn't be seen, it couldn't be found. Okay? So these are the three meanings of the word dalal. And a lot of times, this particular ayah, and there's an ayah that is very similar to this, Africa. There's an ayah very similar to this in Surah Duha about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where Allah says, وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالًا فَهَدَى And He, Allah, found you ضَال and He guided you. And it is pretty much by the consensus of the Mufassirun, the scholars, that what's meant there and what's meant here. When speaking about prophets of God, it is not the second meaning, which means to be completely devoid of any guidance, to be astray, to be deviant, to be in disbelief. That's not what it means. But it's the first meaning that I, you were unaware. Your Lord found you unaware of the answers to humanity's problems. Your Lord found you unaware to the secrets of life. Fahada. And He guided you to those answers. اِقْرَأْ بِاسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ By giving you the Qur'an. And similarly here, Musa is saying, وَأَنَا مِنَ الضَّالِينَ I was unaware of what I was supposed to do with my life. What my purpose in life was. But now Allah has provided that for me. But it cannot be translated as that they were deviant or misguided or evil. Because prophets of God, we do not attribute those things to them. Prophets of God are not these type of, uh, you know, almost redemption stories where somebody was evil and then turns to good. Alright? That's not what the prophets of Allah are. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the prophets. إِنَّ اللَّهَ اصْطَفَى آدَمَ وَنُوحًا Ibrahima wa ala Imran al alamin. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the Prophets of Allah that the Prophets of Allah were created pure and chosen from the very get-go by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to serve this purpose. So we do not attribute evil to them even before revelation came to them. We do not attribute evil to them. Alright? So that's something that's very, very important to be remembered here. So a lot of times folks get the translation. Um, incorrect and it causes a lot of confusion amongst people but the proper way to translate it whether it be the ayah in surah duha where Allah says well, what did the kabbalan? that he found you unaware and then he guided you to the answers to the questions that you had or here qala fa'altuha Musa alayhi salam said yes I made that mistake idhan back when wa ana min al when I was unaware of what to do alright then in ayah number 21 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues on Musa alayhi salam's narrative. Musa alayhi salam continues on saying, فَفَرَرْتُ مِنْكُمْ And due to that, I ran away from y'all. I ran away from y'all. And that too wasn't just some like some panic, right? But rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us exactly why Musa alayhi salam left from there, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that there was a person from Banu Israel who came to Musa alayhi salam and told Musa alayhi salam that they intend to kill you. He said, وَجَاءَ رَجُلٌ مِنْ أَقَصَ الْمَدِينَةِ يَسْعَى قَالَ يَا مُوسَى إِنَّ الْمَلَأَ يَأْتَمِرُونَ بِكَ لِيَقْتُلُوكَ فَخْرُجْ إِنِّي لَكَ مِنَ النَّاسِحِينَ in Surah Al-Qasas, in Surah number 28, ayah number 20, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that a man came from a distance to Musa alayhi salam and he said, Oh Musa, that the elite, the elite people, they have gathered together and they are talking about you. 
and they are conspiring to murder you. So you need to leave here because I have come to you because I want what's best for you. I think you're a good person. You were caught in an unfortunate situation and you need to leave. You need to go. So it wasn't just that Musa Alisam just got up and ran, but this was something that he was given this counsel by someone and he was told that you need to leave here for your own safety. So it, nevertheless he says, فَفَرَرْتُ minkum." Again, this is Musa Alisam kind of owning this. He said, yes, and I ran away from you all. لَمَّا خِفْتُكُمْ When I was afraid that y'all were going to try to kill me. And I had that on sound information. فَوَهَبَ لِي رَبِّي حُكْمًا But then my Lord gifted to me wisdom. And gave me a purpose. The word hukum can refer both to wisdom and it can also refer to a command, purpose. My Lord gave me purpose and gave me wisdom. وَجَعَلَنِي مِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ and he made me from amongst the messengers. So I went away, but then my Lord, He spoke to me, made me a messenger, gave me a mission, gave me a purpose, and that's why I'm here. And then He responds to the very first thing. Now there's a lot of wisdom here. I had mentioned this earlier, that some of the Mufassirun, like Islahi and Mufti Shafi Uthmani, rahimahumallahu ta'ala, some of them have talked about the fact that one of the great lessons from this surah is that it teaches us a lot of lessons and wisdom about how to go about in da'wah related activities. How do you approach people, talk to people, address people, interact with people? How do you do that? Okay, how do you relate the message to people? And so we see here. The very first thing that Fir'aun did, so you see a to total lack of wisdom on Fir'aun's part. When Musa Alisa went to him in a very dignified way, he gave him a message. He told him, Inna Rasulu Rabbil Alameen, An Arsil Ma'ana Bani Israel. We've come to you with a message from God, and you need to release these people. You need to have mercy upon these people. He didn't talk about himself, he didn't talk about Fir'aun, he didn't accuse him of anything, he didn't bring up his indiscretions, he just simply said, look, I'm here with a message from God, heed that message, and have mercy upon these people. Dignified. Fir'aun, the very first thing he says, he says, I let you live when you were a baby. And I raised you, I fed you. That's the very first thing he mentions. And then he goes on to mentioning, and you made this mistake and that mistake. But look at the response of Musa a.s. Musa a.s., the, the, the second one, okay, at least that's an accusation of a crime. It's still underhanded. Right? It's still underhanded. But at least it's an accusation of a crime. But the very first one is just more like kind of a personal attack. But when Musa a.s. responds to him, he first responds to the, the accusation. The allegation of a crime. Right? He doesn't address the personal attack. When think about it, if I think to myself, I know I'd respond to the personal attack first and foremost. But that's a lack of wisdom. But Musa Ali Sam doesn't go to the personal attack first. Because there's a bigger purpose and objective here. This isn't about me, this isn't about you, this is about something bigger. So he first responds to the allegation of the crime. Yes, I committed that crime. It was a mistake though, not the way you're painting it out to be. And also since then I've made my amends. And then, he then finally at the end, he addresses the personal attack. And what does he say? He says, وَتِلْكَ نِعْمَةٌ تَمُنُّهَا عَلَيَّ And the favor that you recount upon me, the favor that you're mentioning upon me, that I did this huge favor to you, I let you live as a baby. And I actually let you continue to live and grow up as a human being. That favor, you recount that favor to me? An abbatta bani Israel? In response to the fact that you have committed atrocities against the people of bani Israel? You think somehow the two balance out? This is Jawab al Zami, Jawab in Kari. He's refuting him. But he's refuting him by saying, You tell me, does that make any sense? I tell you, 
Stop enslaving these people. Stop persecuting them, murdering them. Stop this. And you respond by saying that, hey, I let you live, didn't I? And I fed you, didn't I? What does that have to do with this? And do you think, are you crazy? Enough to think that that somehow justifies this? Some of the Mufassirun, like Qatada and Ibn Zayd, they even mentioned, so Zayd ibn Aslam, excuse me, Zayd ibn Aslam and Qatada, these are the students of the Sahaba of Ibn Abbas, they even mentioned the fact that what Musa salam intended by saying this was, if you hadn't murdered and killed all of my people, I wouldn't needed your mercy. You vile, wretched human. If you hadn't massacred my people, you think I needed to be living in your home? I would have grown up with my family. I'd be with my people. I didn't need your mercy. You created the circumstance that put me in the situation that I was as a helpless baby. And then the fact that you decided not to murder me as a baby, not to mention, then somehow you act like you did a favor. You created the circumstance. How demented and twisted are you? You mentioned this great favor upon me in exchange in lieu of the fact that you enslaved the people of Israel? Have you lost your mind? What are you talking about? And so that's the initial conversation and just the introduction in the court of Fir'aun. Now from ayah number 22 forward will be the actual discussion of the message. And inshallah, that's something, I, or starting from, excuse me, I said ayah number 22 from ayah number 23. Starting from there, inshallah, that's what we'll discuss in the next session. We'll go ahead and stop here today, primarily because that's all I prepared for. <laughs> all right? Um, this usually comes up uh, every year where usually I go a couple of minutes over, and then one day, miraculously, I end, you know, 15 minutes before, and it's always kind of curious. Like, you're always running over time. Why don't you use the time today? But it becomes a little teachable moment. It becomes a little teachable moment of about a lesson that I'm still trying to practice and learn myself. I told you all this morning about one of the very great scholars that I had the uh, privilege and the honor of sitting with and benefiting from. I was telling you that he taught Sahih Bukhari for over 50 years. Till today, every single day, before he would go out to teach Sahih Bukhari, he would teach it for two hours every day, he would sit and still prepare for about four to five hours. He's been teaching the same book for over 50 years, and he would still sit there and prepare and research for hours, twice the time that he would actually be teaching. And we've seen this with a number of our teachers. Number of our teachers. One of my teachers that uh, some of our advanced students at the seminary, the Almiya students they got to benefit from this year, Dr. Masood, he would teach them for about an hour, an hour and a half every morning. And he himself personally, the night before and that morning after Fajr, he would prepare to teach that hour. He would usually put in about four to five hours worth of preparation. And this is one of, without exaggeration, he's probably one of the most intelligent human beings I've ever interacted with. His intelligence is like astounding. And, but this is what we learn from our teachers. That this deen, and this knowledge, this ilm, this is not something that you do off the cuff. It's not something, you don't wing it. Alright? This is not that. This is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sunnah of the Prophet And the integrity of that knowledge is that you give it its due. مَنْ طَلَبَ الْعُلَى سَحَرَ الْلَيَادِ بِقَدْرِ الْكَدِّي تُكْتَسَبُ الْمَعَامِ Right? Whoever really, really wants to attain enlightenment, they have to stay up throughout the night. Because you run out of time in the day. So you have to sacrifice your sleep to read and study. Because of, according to the amount of work you put in, Allah opens the meaning upon you. Juhd. Right? And so, work needs to be put in. That's the integrity of ilm. And we always need to be prepared. We never speak, we never talk, we never lecture, we never teach without preparation. 
refuse to do so. That's very, very important. And so, that's where we're at. All right? So we'll stop here at ayah number 22 because that's all I got to prepare for. Um, and inshallah we'll conclude here. Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Nasaghfiruka wa natubu ilayka.